am honored by your struggle to be silent. You watch. You try to repress your sound so as to allow the film sounds to take over. It is the film which speaks and splutters. You sit still. You try not to make a sound. This film will be in sync. The moving images spill over into the sound strip area and are both the notation and the score, the film and its soundtrack. Sound you see. Try to be in perpetual perceptual sync. Watch closely and listen carefully. I am the voiceover. The art of film holds the promise of redemption from the curse of Babel. The screens of the entire world are now starting to project the first international language, the language of gestures. Quiet, silent film speaks. The first visible sound pattern ever looked, ever seen looked like a star with 10 or 12 rays. A small sun the shape of its own vibration. Light figure, fire writing. To every tone corresponds a shape, perfectly geometrical. Thus, every seeing with the inner eye is hearing, and hearing is a seeing through and within. There is never a thought or an idea without its hieroglyph, its letter, its writing. The shapes change but always turn in on themselves in explosive symmetry. Unlike the dream, the shape of reverie is a star pattern. It returns to its center to shoot out new beams. During the planet Mars' closest approach, radios around the world went off the air in order to allow the interception of any possible messages from space. When translated onto photographic tape, the signals received produced crudely drawn human faces. Human beings have forgotten how to speak and have become invisible, silent, yearning for a new language of gestures. We are beginning to recall this forgotten language and are poised to learn it anew. Today, this visual man is in an in-between state, no longer there and not yet present. Sound takes time. It travels with some delay. We see the flash of lightning before we hear the thunder. In film, the sound is always a few frames later than the image. The picture gate and the sound head are several frames apart, side by side, yet slightly behind one another on the path of the film strip. Sound takes time, it travels with some delay. We see the flash of lightning before we hear the thunder. In film, the sound is always a few frames later than the image. The picture gate and the sound head are several frames apart, side by side, yet slightly behind one another on the path of the film strip. You see the image, but its sound is manifest a second later, synchronized, but not a perfect fit. In silent film, man and things are united as equals. 
In the universal silence of the image, the fragments of a broken vase could talk exactly the way a character talked to his neighbor. The introduction of speech breaks the silence, makes us focus on the monotonous motions of the mouth. It's a vase, it's a face. It's a vase, it's a face. Two mouths, silent, on the verge of speech. Face-to-face -face communication we cannot hear. Between them, a sound strip is formed, a harmonic wave. I can play your profile. I wonder how your nose will sound. Run it through the projector and give it voice. Any design repeated often enough on a soundtrack is audible. Try a portrait of Beethoven repeated 50 times per second. Turns from out of nowhere, a strange sound sequence, a third dimension, so to speak, of the written and spoken alphabet. Sound is the inner life of an object speaking. Sound is the expression of the inner plastic structure of things. All we need to do to liberate that spirit is to brush past the object and to draw forth its sound. Touch, make it sound and resound. I touch and awaken the inner core, the center. My fingerprints spiral into a strange umbilical hole, a cave, a place suggesting entry and yet closed. Loop, whirl, arch. I can feel the voice of my skin. These are hand-wrought sounds. My autographic signature becomes a new alphabet of gestures. My forensic self, the sound of my skin print of light. I leave something of my voice on everything I touch. True optoacoustical synthesis. A new and infinitely delicate point in the texture of reality, which seems to be appealing to me as if seeking help. What is gesture? First, it is movement. Second, it is a direction-giving sign. Gesture is, by definition, in the realm of the line, though it may sweep up surfaces and would sometimes go into space. Abstract forms, reassembled and juxtaposed, are developed in the language of gestures. This universal language, being based upon the interrelationship of elementary forms and the laws of perception, ought to be independent of nationality and race. You may lose yourself in this enigmatic forest of lines, this area of movement, these abstract narratives of pure form. In viewing these geometric polarities, the beholder experiences it as a process. The eye is stimulated to an especially active participation through the necessity of memorizing, despite the resistance to conventional narrative. <laughs> Holding on and letting go. Rhythm becomes articulated time. Sound latches onto rhythm, finding patterns of recurrence. In spiraling, the center makes itself known. 
The axis reveals itself as it corkscrews, turning, spinning, looped in on itself. The inner sound coils like a mental fingerprint, imprinting itself perceptually and yet ungraspable, slipping away. These geometries are structured according to conflict, counterpoint, a syntax based on oppositions between attracting and repelling forms, repeating and folding in upon themselves. Boundaries and contrast are reinforced as they dissolve. It is an alphabet you cannot read, you can follow and immerse yourself, but it remains undecipherable, illegible, suggesting language whilst slipping away beyond language. Through the orchestration of heavy light, we seek a universal understanding, a hieroglyphic truth, an unknown ideogram. By taking the whole movie screen, pressing it together and opening it up, top, bottom, sides, right, left, you don't perceive form anymore, you perceive movement. When you repeat the same form over and over again and in different positions, it is the relationship between the positions that becomes the thing to be perceived not the individual form. One doesn't see the form or object anymore, but rather the relationship. In this way, you see a kind of rhythm. There is nothing to latch onto. We are inside the movement. The spiral awakens the third tone. The inner ear reveals a way in, a door, a cave. This is the way. Step inside. In the cinema, I dissolve into all things and beings. I lose myself. To see movement, organized movement, wakes us up, wakes up resistances, wakes up the refluxes. The film gives memory nothing to hang on to. At the mercy of feeling, reduced to going with the rhythm according to the successive rise and fall of the breath and of the heartbeat, we are given a sense of what feeling and perceiving really is, a process, movement. This movement, with its own organic structure, is not tied to the power of association, nor indeed to content at all but follows instead its own inevitable mechanical laws. The language you see is unfolding like a diagram of time, 
unwinding like a scroll, caught up in the spool so that all you can hold on to is the present. All you can access of this diagrammatic time is the slippages of movement from one coil to the other. The language you see is unfolding, a diagram of time, slipping in and out, in and out, losing yourself and finding yourself, being within and without, dazed into the film and disturbed out of it, intoxicated by the nicotine. The film has you in a permanent state of overexcited unconsciousness, yielding to its suggestion, but then awakening with a start. You see the light. You hear the projector. You're here now, sucked up into the soothing light and ejected back into its surrounding darkness. You see the light, you hear the projector. You're here now, sucked up into its soothing light and ejected back into its surrounding darkness. You see the light, you hear the projector. You're here now, sucked up into its soothing light and ejected back into its surrounding darkness. Wake up. Um, good evening. Um, my name is Ian Christie, and it's uh, a great pleasure to follow um, Ara's performance by welcoming uh, Hotila um, Maholinaj to the stage. It's a great thrill for me, and I think it probably is for everybody, that you're here. It's a thrill for me also. <laughs> this, is more, this is a wonderful occasion. It is. Well, I, I, my, um, I discovered Molly Naj's work, I think, when I was a student, uh, when I first saw Painting, Photography, Film, the great book, which had a kind of manifesto quality and uh, really, um, well, I, it made me a, a kind of uh, an admirer for the rest of my life. But I think for many people, um, Film is not really something that they associate with Mali in, in the sense that well, we don't think of him as a, a filmmaker. We think of him as somebody who had a vision of what film meant, its importance. But it's great to see this range of his work. Oh, well, you, you haven't even seen all of it. No, indeed. I was going to ask you, how, how representative are the films that we've seen of all the film work that he did? Um, well, the, the early films, the European films, are, are well re represented. Um, what many people don't know is, or don't realize is that um, he continued to film in Chicago. And these films uh, have really never been shown outside the school and certainly never been shown until, um, I mean, never been shown after he died. So. They're, um, they're kind of, they're, we have to revive them, in other words. Um, right. the, the, the techniques are similar, they're silent films. What makes them interesting is that they're color films. Mm -hmm. um, Maholi was very happy with Kodachrome, yeah. which is wonderful because of the staying power, uh, because it lasts. It survived when all the other color film has faded. Yes, it, it's. Um, can can you hear me? Oh, all right. Oh, good. 
Um, I'm, I'm booming when you sound a little faint, so I don't know whether it's possible to adjust the microphones. Yes. Well, anyway, yes, it, it was a lucky thing that, yeah. that he did use Kodachrome, yeah. and that yeah. the films have been uh, fairly well preserved. But you, you said something interesting, which I think we can make a connection here. You said the films are silent. And of course, um, I suppose like many artist filmmakers, Mahovi really had, well, never got, was never able to use the new resources of synchronized sound um, as perhaps he might have wanted to. Um, and what uh, Ara's performance goes back to, I suppose, is the kind of the, the dramatic impact that um, sound had and the fascination that sound had for those who had first seen film as a, as a silent medium with sound recording as something separate. When they came together, it was something really quite revolutionary, which many artists were excited by, uh, as distinct from the guardians of the flame of silent film who were horrified by it. <laughs> but I think Maholi was not one of those. Oh, no, he wasn't. Um, in fact, he had hoped to, to put sound on for example, gypsies. And um, uh, one of the problems were, I think was just technical. Um, his, the f his most famous film, uh, A Light Play, Black, White, Gray, he played to a number of, of recordings. He, like he'd you know, show the film and play a, a record with it. Um, but that was sort of a, like a makeshift sort of thing. If, um, if, he, could, if he could have, coped with the technology better. He, he certainly would have, I think. Yeah. Well, one of the inspirations for my film was the, f the Sounds ABC film, which is lost and which, um, was it not lost? Have you found it? Or? <laughs> no, I, I wish I had. I yeah. mean, it's, no, it, has, it does seem to have been lost. I hope it shows up somewhere. Uh, a copy shows up somewhere, mm. but as far as we know, it's lost. Well, the inspiration for me was um, I'd actually been reading his text, Production Reproduction, from 1922, I think, where he talks about um, the possibility of creating synthetic sound, or rather sound out of nothing that hasn't been pre-recorded using um, microscopic incisions on a gramophone record or a phonograph. Um, and then that technology, which the phonograph didn't enable, actually became possible through um, film. Yes. And it was probably, I think, 1933 that he then wrote about it in New Film Experiments, and by then he'd made that film, but other people in Russia and Oscar Fischinger and lots of other filmmakers had been working with the, the little soundtrack area. And that's what really interested me about his work. Um, and the light play, I think, is just fascinating because, in a sense, it's, it's again, that idea... I don't know if people were here in the earlier screening, the, the first one, which was... Uh, a selection of films curated also by Hans Richter. And it's that idea of looking at um, abstract film in a musical way or kind of understanding rhythm um, in movement, so patterns of movement in, in film, in abstraction, in some kind of, uh, not necessarily as a notation or a score, but as something that has something essentially musical about it. And, and of course, some artists would, would carry that forward in the 30s and um, create graphic soundtracks where you draw the soundtrack and see what happens, mm. which is what your yeah. piece evokes very, very powerfully, I think, as well as referencing the structural film of the 70s. What I like is you've got a double focus. Yes, yes, very much so. I mean, actually, the, this, this project comes from a film that I made about uh, phonograph grooves, which is how I first encountered uh, the Maholi Naj text I was referencing earlier. And then this film has kind of shot forward into structuralist film. So it's kind of, it's quite an interesting nexus. And I think what really comes through, what really fascinates me is the way that these artists, structuralist filmmakers, um, people working particularly in Germany in the 30s were experimenting with the technology and what you were talking about in terms of synchronized sound. They were really exploring how sound incorporated into the film might actually suggest a whole new way of creating meaning, which is where the idea of language, or universal language, or a new way of, um, of matching sound and image, which, which I think the technology enabled them because they were so experimental. You know, they weren't afraid to try things that were unconventional, like drawing on the soundtrack. I mean, the idea of the fingerprints mm. is actually, according to his account, in fact, I'm quote, I quote him in a little bit of the text where he says, I can play your profile. Again, the idea of playing a nose 
or that he put little, um, that he used fingerprints to hear the sounds of the, of the print itself as a soundtrack. Yeah. Rilke had the idea that you could play the lines of the skull. The skull yeah. That's what my first film <laughs> yes. was about, actually, exactly. the other yeah. one, yeah. Can I, I just want to go back to a slightly earlier moment, because I think this is interesting in the context of talking about the, the Bauhaus and film, because as we, any of you who are here for last night's discussion with Thomas Toder, we were talking about the fact that, um, in, in a sense, the, the paradox of this, these screenings is that the Bauhaus didn't actually produce any film, um, but there's a lot of film around the Bauhaus. It's all produced outside really the Bauhaus as such, and of course the work by Maholi that we've been seeing is all post his Bauhaus career. And I just wanted to quote something which I came across. I, I wrote a piece in, about the Bauhaus in film for, for Sight and Sound, and I found this wonderful quote, uh, which is a, it's a letter from, I think it's from Feininger, Lionel Feininger to Paul Clay, and he says that, and, and this is written in what, 1923, when Maholi's just arrived at the Bauhaus, and these two painters, one writes to the other, there's an incessant talk of cinema, optics, projection, and continuous motion, and even transparencies stored like gramophone records. What space is there for us poor painters? <laughs> and I think, before we kind of, you know, sink into a happy reverie about the Bauhaus was all kind of wonderful, we ought to remember that actually, I think Maholi's arrival with his interest in these new media, was actually rather threatening, rather challenging to some of the old guard. Yeah. Well, that, that um, was mentioned by Jens Schmoll in his, um, his quote from Paul Citron, that Maholi burst in like a big, eager dog. And, you know, I could just, that's, that's very, you know, that's very vivid. Um, no, there was... The Bauhaus was full of, of dissension and, 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 and disagreement. I mean, it must have been like herding cats just to keep the whole thing together. Um, <laughs> a real challenge. Yeah, yeah. But there was a sense that Maholi, who um, was fascinated by new media and by, by, just, um, by the interaction of media, to us, I think, he had seen the future, as it were, and he, he had glimpsed almost before anybody that the interaction of these media would create something new and powerful, a new, a new synthesis. Um, whereas I think for others who were, of course, modernists in their own way, all of them, uh, that was not really the case, and they were worried about the traditional arts and crafts, and they saw it as a threat. Yes, yes they did. Some of them did. Um, again, that comes out in, in Jan Schmoll's film. Yeah. But, uh, and so, in a sense, for Maholi to pursue his, his belief in um, what he could do photography at the, at the Bauhaus, of course, and did very much introduce photography into its, its activities, but to do film, that all comes later. And he's using whatever opportunities arise to make what we would call today, I suppose, independent films, films that weren't funded by anybody, or the opportunities that you know, commercial work offered him. And so it was an improvised career in film, really, wasn't it? Um, yes, yes, that's a very good point. Yes, very much. I think certainly. Um, when when he left the Bauhaus, um, he was a freelancer, and in a way, a, a lot a lot of he sort of fell into a lot of things. Uh, filming, he was always looking for um, patrons. Um, he had to support himself by doing advertising and, and taking things on commission. I mean, he sort of fell into color photography that way, too. Um, so, yes, he had a very uh, exciting uh, uh, and kind of uncertain career until, um, really, until he came to Chicago and, and, um, and founded the school. Yeah. Yeah. Because, I mean, one of the sadnesses for us in Britain is that during his time in Britain, um, he, he had the possibility uh, of being helped perhaps by his compatriot, uh, Alexander Corder, who was the biggest movie mogul in Britain at the time. And uh, one of the, the sad um, non-events in Maholi's career is that uh, when he was taken on to work on Things to Come, the science fiction epic, uh, which would have been made for him, of course, with all its opportunities to show the, the new city being created, the corders didn't use any of his material, as far as we know. But just, just
just a few seconds of it, a few glimpses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that is um, that is a shame. But on the other hand, and this is interesting, that there these sets that he um, that he conceived of and and built models of. The photographs of these have sort of taken on another life of their own, uh, as, as this exhibition at the first site in Colchester right now. I, I lent perhaps a dozen photographs to them. So it's not that it's been lost, it's just been recontextualized. <laughs> um, that's, that's, that's a good way of looking at it. Uh, yes, it surprised me too. <laughs> <laughs> but just, just to make one more comment on what we did see on the screen. Um, th th I think there's such a contrast, isn't there, between the wonderful gypsy film, the, the, the city gypsies, which really takes you back to something, which is, again, it's easy to forget about Maholi, that he was Hungarian, since he spent his life as an itinerant, as a kind of international gypsy. Yes. There's a real feeling about that film, isn't there? It's not sentimental. It's really fascinated by the particularity of gypsy life. I think it's the strongest film. Uh, I think other people think so too. Um, it, there's this trilogy, the Marseille film, the Berlin film, and then the, the Gypsies. And of the three, I think the, the Gypsy film is the most successful. Um, it, um, it contradicts a lot of our stereotypes about Gypsies. Uh, what, what impressed me about these Gypsies is that they seem to be doing so well. I mean, no, really. They're, they, they, they look different. You know, they're they're not perhaps the tidiest people in the world, but they they look prosperous. Mm -hmm. um, their horses are beautiful, um, and I think it's Maholi liked animals, and and he liked horses. He was he. Uh, this is I think due to World War One when he he had to have a horse to to be in the artillery. But this, you know, the first scene of the horse grazing through this garbage-strewn field. And, you know, waving its ears a little bit. I think, you know, that's just a good way to start the movie. Um, so I, um, I, I, I think that that film is is perhaps the one he put most of his heart into. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas the the London film, which is really very much a kind of film, I suppose, made to order, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, again, rather poignantly for me, anyway, records you know one of our one of our few monuments to modernism from the 30s, which is the penguin pool, Lubetkin's penguin pool. <laughs> there is something quite cute about, you know, our modernism takes the form of a, a penguin pool in the zoo. <laughs> it's not Chicago, is it? <laughs> well, um, it, it's, it's, it's also a very nice film. I mean, he, um, the, these films, well, I mean, I, I'm old enough to remember that that these short subject films were terribly important uh, in in movie theaters. Um, you had the feature, and then you had the short subjects, and so there was always a market for them. Yeah. So this film and another one on lobsters yeah. were were two commissioned films yeah. that he did here in in, um, in England. Well, the, the commissioned film was very important. It's the only way that artists like Maholi and Len Lai and um, and uh, um, Fischinger and all of those artists, the only way they could get their hands on the, the, the latest uh, equipment and, and film stock was to make commissioned films. Yeah. So it was, it was, as you say, it was vital. Yeah. But I just wanted to say, I mean, of course, the other thing that we haven't really talked about is that, that uh, Ara's piece is a performance piece. And Thomas yes. Todu was talking yesterday uh, very eloquently about uh, it's a mistake to see the Bauhaus as just producing objects. The Bauhaus was about performance, perhaps, more than anything else. Uh, and is that in your mind when you created the piece? Um, not particularly. I mean, I have always been interested in the Bauhaus, and Schlemmer is someone I find really fascinating. And um, kind of probably for similar reasons, kind of patterns and geometries, and a kind of bent towards abstraction, even whilst using the human figure. Um, but I wasn't particularly thinking of that. I think for me, what interested me was the, the way in which the patterns create sounds, and then through some of the voiceover, which actually the, the fact that it's light modulated is the inverse principle of the, of the film negative um, sound strip area. Um, 
it was just to add that other dimension, because I think what I find really fascinating about abstract film is that perceptual mode that you enter, which is that it isn't narrative, but somehow you're engaged and you're drawn into the film, which is, I guess, Eisenstein. You know, it's all these things that is essential that are essential mm -hmm. to film and kind of criticized as well in terms of its manipulation of its audience. But in abstraction, something else happens whereby you're you're drawn in, and you just kind of lose yourself in something that's not quite hypnosis, it's not quite um, narrative absorption, it's something else. And I think that's very specific to abstract film. And I could just show the film on its own in that way, but by providing some kind of voiceover that just, even if you hear it in a slightly dreamy way or you don't, you're not really listening, it just gives that direction a certain alienation, to, you know, a, a certain kind of awareness as to what mental perceptual state you're in when you're looking at sound and images. So that was that was the main inspiration. But I am obviously really interested. I mean, I dressed. I didn't realize this, but um, I actually I bought this because I like the patterns. And obviously, I've made other films with patterns. But then I saw the exhibition and saw that they had these parties where the dress code was 50-50 uh, black and white. So <laughs> I did my best. <laughs> you did superbly. You're dressed for the occasion. <laughs> Okay, it's time, I think, to, to give people uh, a chance to, to ask questions or, or comment on, on what we've seen. So I think there are some microphones. If you, can, if you want to stick your hand up, if you'd like to say something, and a microphone will reach you. Anybody like to start? Aha. Uh -huh. he, he used mu very good music for the gypsy film, and I just wonder yes. whether he ever used that to, to, to make an, actually an accompaniment for the whole of the gypsy film. And oh. whether you can say anything a bit about Schmoll's career, I don't know him otherwise. Yeah, well, you know, I, w I wish I knew more about it too. I, uh, when I told him that I was going to be here, I asked him for his CV, and he didn't send anything. So, I, I, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, he, um, this was this film, the film he made, <clears throat> Permanent Experiment, was his um, his diploma work. He got his degree with this film, and. What happened after that and now, I don't know. He, he works in Munich. Um, he's still involved in film, but I don't know what else he's done. Um, but he didn't, he didn't put music on the whole film of Gypsies. It was just that excerpt. Um, but I think he did a wonderful job with the soundtrack. I mean, it was, um, I don't know where he, you know, he doesn't give any credits for the for, where, for his sources, so I don't know where he got that music from. I agree. Any, anyone else like to join in? Ah, right. Hi, um, I wanted to ask you something uh, about the two films and the two, let's say, Moholinage and uh, or as that film, because there seems to be a sort of main difference. The films of Molinaji enabled us and them at the time to see something differently and better through the camera. And I think what Aura's films are doing is something very, very differently, because we see things that we wouldn't, we wouldn't see otherwise. So uh, I wanted to ask you both if you could talk about movement in Aura's film and then movement in the film of Moalinaji. For example, at the end of The Gypsy, there was all that uh, recording about gypsy dances. And so I wanted to ask you this. Um, well, in terms of my film, the almost all the footage is either moving or very brief um, intercut um, sequences so that you get a change in pitch for the most part. Um, and also the idea of the film constantly moving. I just like that idea of circularity of the film itself, having that kind of um, being on a spool. Well, I mean, it, it, it's obvious that just in that selection of films that we've seen of Maholi's, um, 
movement is an extremely important part of it. Even he's interested in filming movement, he's interested in introducing movement into the filming uh, of what would otherwise be still lives, uh, st static material. And so for him, clearly, movement was absolutely primordial in film. But um, yes, I suppose, sorry, I'm, I'm answering the question for you. Over to <laughs> I'm, glad. I'm, I'm afraid I don't know how to answer it because it just seems obvious that a, a movie is a movie. I mean, that's what it is. I wanted to talk about the different ways in uh, representing movement and how, of course, at the time, a movie is a movie, but the experiments that a camp... I mean, it was the, the beginning of, of movies, so there was something very interesting there. Also, the whole views from above and depict, depicting movement from above and offering another view. And, um, well, I mean, he, his, his movie style actually is close to his still photography um, uh, style. And in, in fact, many of the um, scenes that you see in, in the films, he also captured with a still camera while he was filming. So, I mean, they're identical. So it was just, it's a, it's a way of recording things. I mean, a movie is, is a superior way of, of recording motion. And you can add sound to it, you can add color to it. I mean, movies are the most vivid thing. Um, this goes back to something that you said, that you kind of lose yourself in an abstract. I think you can do that in a figurative film, too. I mean, well, Totally. A, no, I mean, I think I, I was mentioning that as something um, which is kind of very much obvious with most narrative film, is that you come, you sit in a dark space and you completely forget any sense of time and you lose yourself in the film but mm -hmm. what I find interesting about abstract film is it's not the pathway in isn't as easy because you can't just completely lose yourself right. and what happens is because you're to some degree aware of the fact that you're perceiving so you have a kind of you don't lose yourself completely you have a, an awareness to the act of perception you're in this play between being in the film and coming back into the present of being a body watching a film. So that, that's what I find interesting about abstract film. I mean, I was thinking that as I watched um, the light space modulator film, which um, I've watched many times on a small screen. It was great to see it. And I, and I had exactly that feeling that you could just lose yourself in the detail of it. And part of you is trying to figure out how some shapes are made. And another part of you is just like, I'm just going to go with this flow because it's beautiful and interesting. And it's that. Yeah, I think with a story, it's easier to just abandon yourself yeah, to the movie. But, but I mean, film, even st uh, narrative films and abstract films have that quality that other media don't have. And I, I found that very exciting, what you, what you pointed out. Yeah, well, I'm That's excited by it, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> I think it, it also, uh, also mm. what the, the whole program this evening does, I think, is to uh, kind of call into question um, the idea that there is some, you know, uh, opposition between uh, abstract film, which is kind of higher and purer, and figurative film, which is more kind of conventional, because clearly, in Maholi's case, there isn't that distinction. He made one of the, the great pioneering abstract works in the, um, uh, that we saw, the, the film produced by the light, light space modulator. But he also finds equally interesting just recording the sort of minute eye of life in in Marseille and Berlin, which has the same kind of fascination because of its formal qualities and because of its human qualities. So it's it's quite instructive to, um, I think, just break down that distinction. It wasn't a distinction, I think, that was very meaningful in the 1920s. It wasn't that you had to be on one side or the other side. You mm. could do both. Well, someone like Walter Ruttmann is a good example. Um, and some of his films were shown earlier today, and he, these beautiful kind of abstract animations, and then he moved into documentary. Um, but I, I think structuring principle is, was different. Um, I think it was different. I mean, it seemed to me that Maholi's films um, featuring people had a very kind of human quality where he was very attentive to laughter and play and um, you know, dancing and children and a certain kind of gestural freedom. He seems to, to really pay attention to those things and um, and it's very playful and maybe the abstract films are playful 
but in a different way, I think. I think there is maybe just this, the, the kind of creative principle is slightly different. Although, of course, in the same person, those two aren't an opposition because yeah. Yeah, several filmmakers move between those two styles. Anybody else like to join in? I think, is that a, a head being scratched or a hand being raised? <laughs> it's a hand up. <laughs> Good. Both abstract and figurative. Um, I was just interested in the, um, the text that you wrote, and I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more about that. How much was it, was it your text, and how much was it Maholi? M my text? Yeah. Um, uh, well. Uh, I, I tend to do a lot of research and, and read a lot of things and kind of take little quotes and then incorporate them or uh, paraphrase them or what's the... <laughs> um, um, but so I am, I am... So actually there's a little line from Rilke which featured in another film of mine which I don't know if anyone identified but it's... Um, uh, seem to be appealing to me as if seeking help, uh, which again is this idea of primal sound. And um, so there's probably one or two little words, uh, sentences by Maholi. Um, so a lot of it is, yeah, it's informed by research and and a lot of thinking that I do, which is actually it's taken me years. It's probably about two years that I've been researching this topic obsessively and I still haven't exhausted my interest in optical sound but um but yeah I don't know how much I mean, percentage wise I couldn't say how much no, I wrote I, I, and how much I, I mean obviously I'm reading all these texts yeah. so that I'm informed by them as well no I thought it worked really well so I was just wondering I, I was interested to know more about it so I mean there's there's references to cage who says, you know, he talks about playing Beethoven's profile 50 times per second. And uh, Hans Richter, um, Hans Richter actually, although people are very critical of his rewriting of history, he, he's actually written some very interesting things around this perceptual state that I'm talking about. And he was very articulate. And actually, I think a lot of the people, a lot of the filmmakers that I'm interested in are people who were very articulate in writing. Um, or, uh, you know, with Maholi, I think he was, he was very much visionary in suggesting possibilities that technology might enable, and, and very utopian, and all of that is actually very inspirational, um, a very inspirational reading, and informs the way that I then think about writing. So. Thanks. Ah. Oh, um, Robert. Yes, Aura. I was, I was just wondering whether, I mean, I'm being a little bit provocative, but um, obviously your film relates to film as a piece of celluloid that goes through a projector in the way that it did for 100 years. Over the last two years, films become a digital um, entity. And I just wondered whether you were, and, and lots of the issues I'm sure that you raise in your piece are relevant to film in its new format. But I was wondering whether there's an opportunity for a sequel there, looking at the same issues within digital, um, digital presentation. Um, well, this is actually my first 16 millimeter film, and it's been a very difficult learning curve. <laughs> Fascinating. Um, and I've been really privileged to work with some great people who have helped me on it um, and learn you know, a new medium. But I, most of my previous films are digital actually. Um, and the next film that I plan to make is, again, about optical sound, but um, about the optical sound camera, which is in Pinewood Studios, and it's one of the last functioning ones. So it is really about this medium that's on the verge of extinction, on the one hand. Um, yeah, I could do a history of technology. <laughs> no, what, what, what I was meaning, are the issues that you raise in the film, are they still relevant are they still appropriate in digital it, it, uh, media yes, because you, you talk about mm -hmm. obviously the soundtrack being mm -hmm. a couple of frames yeah. behind behind the the visual image and uh, now it's a different world well i think one of the reasons I've, I've made several films about obsolete technology and and prior to this one this actually this kind of light space modulator homage is also a homage to the aramics machine which was an uh, a film that I made about this invention using drawn sound principles, but 
towards music rather than in film, but drawn on film strips. Um, and th I think the thing that interests me about obsolete technology is that somehow it becomes more visible, that we can pay more attention to its sculptural quality. So film, 16 millimeter, 35 millimeter, has this incredible, t I'm sure lots of people go on about this, but it has a tactile quality that to me is interesting because it reveals something about the relationship between sound and image. So even the idea of a delay between sound and image is kind of interesting in terms of how we think about sound more generally. But um, yeah, I, I think I'm just slowly, I mean, I've, I've made something about mechanical music and then phonograph grooves and now film, and I might get to <laughs> digital technology, but I don't, I think it's still transparent. It's still something that we use. When I meant, there's a little bit in my text where I talk about transparency of the instrument and the fact that it's, it becomes more opaque when we stop using it. So for me, digital technology, we're in it, and we use it and it's quite hard to see it from the outside because any time, any you know, new media artists, when they try and make, I think, try and make a comment around digital media now, just anything they say, it's immediately outdated. You kind of, you're too caught up in it. Whereas the technology that is, or well, film is actually on the cusp of obsolescence. It's not obsolete, um, you know, it's still alive and well, but, um, but some of the, you know, the art of editing and filming and, you know, all kinds of things that are related to film are, I think, less, uh, less familiar than they were back then. Certainly, and, and will soon be very unfamiliar. <laughs> but that said, I mean, when I was at Pinewood Studios recently and, and the 16 millimeter machine is on the verge of extinction, there won't be... I mean, there's only one that operates and one guy who knows how to use it, and when he's not around, I don't know who will take over. But um, but actually, as I was saying, oh, and the 35 millimeter machine, I was saying, actually, this one's in good shape because digital media is unstable, whereas 35 millimeter is very stable, and people are backing up lots of old of films. Of course. Oh, they because have to. it survives longer. It's so the only, way, it's kind it's of the only ironic. way to preserve the, the material. Yeah, it's true. Um, but I think your your point is a very good one about the the the, uh, um, the fact that it's it's difficult to see digital media because we're immersed in digital media, and it's very interesting that you know you as a as a practicing artist will be very conscious that, for instance, like at, at the Freeze Fair, uh, the Freeze Art Fair here in London, the, the most recent one, I think there were more sixteen mil projectors whirring away than I've ever seen in one place. <laughs> sixteen mil is getting a massive comeback yeah. in the gallery world. <laughs> But I think artists have always been interested in that materiality of kind of, I mean, that's when I've been working at Nowhere, which is this okay. film lab um, that's taken over from the filmmakers co-op. And, um, and I was thinking about it, even as I was watching some of these films, you know, like scratch films or films that have been buried, you know, there's this real interest in taking the material of film and doing something to it. And film lends itself to that. It gets scratched naturally because it is a very fragile medium. You know, it, it crisps or, you know, things happen to it that for artists can be sources of inspiration because they might have a more open mind in terms of receiving some of these glitches and mistakes as something mm. aesthetic. I just, I think our time is very, is, is drawing to an end. I just wanted to, um, Turn back to Adil and just ask, because you said at the very beginning that um, you know there were things that you've been working on in connection with the, the, the Maholinaj Foundation to try to make better known. And I just wondered if you could give us a kind of sense of what it is uh, that you feel still needs to be understood about Maholi and what kind of aspects of his career and his work aren't really in, out there in the public domain. Well, um, I think his his career tends to be compartmentalized. Um, for example, it's it's very obvious in photography. Uh, his European photographs, black and white and still photographs, are very well known. His color photographs are uh, they're starting to be known through a lot of effort and you know trying to get photo historians interested in them, but. Many people have the impression that he sort of hung up his camera when he came to the States and didn't, um, didn't do photographs anymore. A lot of it 
has to do with the, um, the vagaries of, of historical preservation. I mean, much, much of Maholi's later work got lost. The negatives, uh, the slides, and so on, and the films. And um, one thing we're trying to do in the foundation is to um, put these things into some form where they can be distributed, uh, and also to make a catalog of them, a catalog resume, so that um, his, um, his career can be more complete, more well-rounded. And this is one of the nice things about working with Jens Schmoll. He didn't have any preconceived notions. So he was willing to include the um, Kodachrome slides and the late movies. Um, so it's, it's sort of like that. It's to just try and, and, and get a more accurate picture of his career out into the world. It's encouraging to know that there is more to discover. <laughs> uh, it's a problem for every artist that, that when the work becomes canonic, people fasten on the, the things that they know and they don't want to be pushed. Well, that's the thing. I mean, you get sort of an official version um, and that, that fossilizes and it's very hard to change it. Yep. Uh, I mean, if somebody's, if, if we're remembered at all, we're remembered in an official version that gets more and more rigid as time goes on because the details fall off. That's what I, I liked about um, Schmoll, Schmoll's film, is that he included negative comments also, yep. Kepish's comments or um, comments of some of the students. So it was, um, it was very interesting to work with him. Hmm. I learned a lot. Well, I, I think uh, we've all learned a lot and we've seen a lot of a material that we wouldn't have seen before, and we've also seen how Maholi's example is inspiring new work, uh, which is more than I think many artists could hope for uh, this long after their, in, in Maholi's case, tragically short career. It's amazing that he managed to achieve so much in such a short and such a, um, an interrupted career, uh, but he did, and it's, um, it's, uh, I think it's, it's an inspiration to many to see how uh, a life lived under those difficult conditions against the background of having to leave abruptly uh, Europe, make a new life in America, has, has, has left so much behind. So, thank you very much. It's a great honor and pleasure to have you here, as Robert said at the beginning, and thank you, Aura, for making the experience come alive tonight. <laughs>